February 1985, and the notorious Auckland pub The Glue Pot, once a sanctuary for the sailors and their fans, is about to reopen after major renovations. Surreptitiously, the venue's manager invites all the ex-sailors along, and the events that follow lead to a reformation. We, we didn't know that we were going to play a solo sailor, but it had been cunningly designed that we would be playing a solo sailor. And when we played it, there was a, a real spark. And when we came back off stage to a very, very warm applause and an encore, we said, hey, maybe we should do some more gigs. And then all of a sudden there was an album offer, just like that. So we went for it. Huge money is thrown at the album as part of the well-financed but ill-fated spin effects deal. The intention of the producer Englishman Liam Henshaw is to repackage the band for the international market, but in typical sailor fashion, things don't quite go according to plan. I, I was disappointed with the approach taken with the um, ship shape and Bristol. What was it? Ship face and Bristol pack. <laughs> On reflection, it's it's a bit of an album of its time. It's a mirror glass album. It's you know, and we let the production get away from us. I felt cheated with that album because uh, they brought an English producer over who was into electronica and synthesizers and Hollow Sailor's guitar band. This guy had no idea of how to produce a guitar band, and it was crap. I was just a bit disappointed that uh, they were just interested in his selection of what songs um, they should re-record, or I, I just thought he was a producer that didn't really have much understanding of Hello Sailor's past, or it was just a job for him probably, and he probably shaped an album in a, um, not a particularly positive manner. You know. I really sympathize. Can't you see it in my eyes? My broken hearted cries for you. Brazier, in particular, makes no secret of his dislike for the end product. It's taught me one thing, though. Right? Having, comparing Inside Out, which is still highly regarded and costs $10,000 to make, whereas this ship shape in Bristol fashion was up there around about half a million dollars and was crap. It doesn't need money to make a good album. You need passion, good songs, and a belief. And you've got to hold to what you feel is true. You can't let somebody blind you with science just because they're from England or America. Somewhat disillusioned by the relative failure of the album and accompanying tour, the band drift into hiatus. Brazier reforms the Legionnaires and goes on to record the follow-up to his debut, while Harry and Dave pursue solo ventures. But the break doesn't last long. As the 80s draw to a close, the trio hook up again and take an acoustic tour on the road to a warm reception. But I just won't lie, 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 lie the then in 1993, an offer too good to turn down prompts the boys to return to the studio once more. The resulting album, entitled simply The Album, fails to achieve former commercial glories, but does garner the band a Silver Scroll nomination. A very good friend and um, Neo family member offered us the money to record another album, and a good album it was too. I enjoyed the album, I think that's uh, a record that we had a lot of creative control over really, like it was the, Dave Dobbin produced a couple of tracks but most of them were produced by Stuart Pierce who's over the years been our keyboard player and it was a, a very collaborative kind of approach to things.
it was a kind of an eclectic album because all the songs um, came from you know different areas. We weren't all sort of living in each other's pockets at the times. Yeah, it came out quite angular, I think would be a word to describe it. There's some quite rockier numbers on that. Yeah, intense, I guess you could say as well. A few ballads. Hmm. Largely overlooked once again, but I'm sure one day it will surface and be seen for the, for the quality of the songs that were on that album. The next decade sees the band happily reform as the opportunities arise, most notably for a string of sold-out gigs supporting the Dudes as they reform in 2006. Concurrently, the release of the album When Your Lights Are Out, featuring an acoustic reworking of their songbook, becomes their most critically successful effort in years. Um, sometimes we've been criticised for overproducing, um, so that album is, is a little bit more raw and I think because it's acoustic sonically it's quite pleasing it's got you know mandolins and acoustic guitars and things and Hammond organ so it's it's sounds nice and a bit organic so maybe that struck a chord with the reviewers <laughs> and we have Ben from Golden Horse to thank for that because he he insisted that no we did no overdubs we did a few, not many, maybe on one or two songs we did. Just one little vocal session. Yeah. So I think simplicity is the reason it's been well received. Yeah. Plaudits from the nation's music critics seem to confirm the historical relevance of the band. But it also begs the question, just what is it that's kept the band together after all these years? I think there's something about the, the chemistry in the band that keeps drawing us back to it. Some, it's one of those rare things just where the, the personalities and the playing styles and various other things just feel good to all of us. Like, it's great playing guitar in that band for me as a guitar player. It suits me. You know, like Harry and I, guitar players, he's got techniques that I don't have and I've got techniques that he doesn't have. But when we fit them together, they, they fit into a slot together and complement one another and make up that. Total, that total sound, you know, and that's um, that's satisfying or fulfilling for for someone who's obviously um, chosen an artistic career. I guess we're just destined to play together. As long as I can, I'll try and make my money from playing music. I don't think I'll ever take a day job as such. I'm just not cut out for it. Over the years, the sailor's voyage has undoubtedly been a bittersweet mix of rich rewards and frustrating setbacks. But the band have persevered through the peaks and troughs, coming out the other side as genuine Kiwi rock legends. In fact, since their journey started way back in 1975, Hello Sailor have truly achieved some remarkable feats, carving a unique place in our musical landscape. They, they refused to compromise. They decided that they were going to do their thing. They were going to do it their way. They weren't going to listen to pub managers. And they opened a lot of doors. The fact that they had that attitude that the, and the bands that came after them, and, you know, it was because Hello Sailor opened those doors. I think one of the distinctive things about the the music and the material is that we we're one of the first bands to kind of unselfconsciously start singing about Kiwi things. So, you know, name checking um, New Zealand locations and feelings. So, I think that's something. But we came along at a time where nobody was playing original music um, and we made it possible for other bands to play original music and no matter how tenuous, make a living from it. But we were definitely there at the forefront um, cutting a track for other musicians to follow. So were they important? 
they were important to me and what they were doing themselves was important to them and a hell of a lot of people seem to agree and go on agreeing for two or three decades and I think that's what makes them important really. It's the, um, it's the recognition that they've achieved for um, their artistry, their longevity and um, their stickability. Uh, they're not always qualities that artists have. They've got it in spades. They've survived everything. They're still doing it. They're more than important. They're a fucking phenomenon. Am I allowed to say fuck? Absolutely. <laughs>